Good morning, church. If, um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Danelle. I do see a few faces. Welcome to River. Pastors asked me to read uh, from scripture today, which is from Luke 11 um, and Luke 18. Luke 11, it says, Once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus says, This is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. Then, teaching them more about prayer, he used the story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night, and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Verse 11. Your fa you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Luke 18. One day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Verse 6, then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 It takes a lot of courage to ask someone to teach you it takes a lot of courage to admit that you aren't very good at something. To teach me. You know more about this than I do. I want to be good at this like you're good at this. Won't you teach me? It takes a lot of courage to admit that, to take that attitude or that position in life. I've attempted to teach my, uh, my boys how to cast a fly rod, which is a, an artful endeavor. And it takes, it takes a lot of courage and, and a measure of humility to admit, Dad, I, I don't know how to do this very well. Will you, will you teach me how to do this? I've, I've attempted to teach my, my daughter how to swing a golf club, and it takes courage and it takes humility to admit, I, I don't know how to do this. Would you, would you show me how you're better at me than this? And, and I remember some time ago, many years ago, when I was a younger man learning to preach, I had several men, older men, who, who taught me how to preach in the classroom and, and, and in real life. And, and that was, was, for me, a very humbling experience. It takes courage to say, I, I'm not very good at this, but I, I really want to be. So the disciples had to have been fascinated that day. And they had to have, have been humbled and they had to have been courageous. We read in, in or Donnell read in the verse 1 of, of, of Luke 11, 
Uh, once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. So the disciples are, are fascinated. Prayer, uh, Jesus just came out of his, his prayer room or, or he just more likely just came off the mountain, just came off the hill. He'd been praying. He wraps up his prayer and they approach him and they say, teach us to pray. I'd like for us to give one another permission over the next four weeks uh, during this brief sermon series regarding prayer. It's going to be a very, uh, a very devotional sort of four weeks for us. Uh, a fairly simple uh, four weeks for us as we study God's word as it relates to prayer. I would like for us to give one another the permission uh, to admit um, we need lessons in prayer. Raise your hand on the inside as I ask this question. Don't, don't raise your hands on the outside. Only on the inside. But let me ask you this question. Do you live a largely prayerless life? Do you live a largely prayerless life? If you're really honest with yourself. Do you feel as though your prayers are perfunctory or rudimentary or brief and often forgotten or perhaps non-existent? This is a good place to be honest with one another and to be honest with ourselves and, of course, to be honest with God. I believe that's the posture that the disciples took that day. Um, they were... They were the 12 chosen disciples of Jesus, and yet I don't believe it's too much of a stretch to imagine that on that day they felt what we feel, this sense of needing more, wanting more. So if that's you, if you feel as though you need more when it comes to prayer, you want more when it comes to pray. I, I like to say it this way, you want to want to pray. Maybe, maybe you don't even yet wake up really wanting to pray. But, but maybe you're a dad and you would say, I want, that, I want that for my kids. I want my kids to have a dad who prays. So, so I don't yet want to pray. I, don't, I can't, if I'm honest, I don't really wake up with that desire, but, but I want to want to pray. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you put that desire in me? If that's, if that's you, um, then, then that's, it's to that end that, that the next four weeks are devoted. If, if that's not you, then I'm not sure why you're here. Uh, but that's what we're going to be talking about. Jesus in, this, in these two passages, in these two passages, uh, Luke 11 and Luke 18, Jesus gives us three examples. Three examples of how a person with a need, and that's every one of us, Jesus gives three examples of how a person with need, a uh, real life need, approaches someone who can meet that need. That person is the supplier or the the contributor. And I'm the one in need, and so I approach a person who, ha who, who, who has what I need. And, and that is the essence of, of prayer. So Jesus gives us three examples. A person in need approaches a person who has the goods. A Christian ethic, a Christian, a Christian belief a central Christian belief, is that we are a people in need and God is a supplier of needs. The 
Philippians 4.19. It's a very, very familiar passage to some of you. And it says just that. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. A basic Christian tenet is that God is a supplier, the supplier, the meter of all your needs. You're in want, he has what you need. So it all begins with asking. It all starts with a sincere belief that you're approaching someone who in fact has what you need. Like chasing down an ice cream truck with complete confidence that that guy has what you need. He has a supply of ice cream. I don't know if that's such a thing anymore, but when I was a kid, the, the, the ice cream truck would sometimes just go slowly by and you'd have to chase him down. And you would wave your dollar. It didn't cost a dollar back then. I guess like a, a quarter. You would wave your money. And, and he knew what he was looking. He, he knew. He knew. He could spot someone in need. And he would, he would bring that uh, rickety old van to, to a stop and open up that window. And, and you're in, I was in need. And he was my supplier. He had what I needed. And, and I chased him down with confidence. I chased him down with confidence that he was going to supply my need at that moment in time. If you caught up with the, the ice cream truck uh, one day and he was selling um, f fish sticks, you know, I, I, I guess you caught a Schwann's truck instead of, a, however you say that word, instead of, a, instead of an ice cream, if he was selling fish sticks, you would be disappointed. But you've chased down that ice cream truck completely convinced that he can supply your needs. Dear friends, prayer is like that. We would go to God more often and we would go to God more fervently in prayer if we really were confident that he can supply our needs. We don't go to God because we aren't convinced. It's, it's, really, it's really that simple. I've been thinking much today, about, or this week rather, um, about prayerlessness in my own life. Prayerlessness, prayerlessness in your life. And Lydia and I were talking about it the other day and she said something to the effect of life is complicated. And, and we carry a lot of guilt when we go to God in prayer. In fact, we, we often don't get what we want. And so, so we say, eh, I guess it doesn't work that way. I prayed. I, I didn't get what I wanted. Must not work that way. And then, and then as Lydia pointed out to me this week, we, we feel guilty. We feel guilty in going to God in situations that we've created ourselves. Maybe that's you. Maybe you would say, I've, I've gotten myself into this mess. I suppose I'm going to have to get myself out of this mess. What? Maybe you feel guilty. Why would God help me? Maybe he, in fact, is angry with me. And so, so in light of that, in light of those feelings, doubt as to whether God really is the supplier of my needs, guilt and, and wonder as to the possibility that God is maybe angry with me, in light of that, Jesus, one day, told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. They should always pray and never give up.
So Jesus gives them actually, and he gives us actually, three stories. Three stories of people who ask and in fact receive. But there's irony, or, or, or at least a little uh, humor, I believe, in, in the fact, in Jesus' point. Here's Jesus' point. You may miss it if you don't read carefully. Jesus' point in telling these three stories is actually, God's not like this. God's way more than this. You think you have a misperception of who God is in, in his answering your prayers. God's not like this, person number one. God's not like this, person number two. God's not like this, person number three. He is the supplier of every need. Jesus' point in these stories is that God is so ready to answer your prayers. More ready, more ready than any three of these contributors we look at today. These, these providers, these three supporters. Uh, God's way, way, infinitely more ready to answer your prayers. So, so let's, let's consider these three these three stories, if we will. Story number one is 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 uh, maybe the least the least re relevant uh, for for me. Um, but here's how the story goes. There's a friend who's trying to sleep, and 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 he finds you to be a real a real bother. He, he finds you to be a real pain, a real bother. Because you come to him and you knock on his door and you ask for flour to make bread or sugar to make a pie or, and, and you say you have guests and, and, and the, the, the friend, he's bothered, it's late at night, he has locked his door for the evening, he has put his children to bed for the evening and, and, and now you are knocking on the door. And, and I, say, I say this is the least relevant story to me. Actually, maybe it's the most relevant. What, here's what I mean by that. I would never do this. I would go without. One of my, one of my, one of my fears in life is, see if you can relate, being a bother. I go to a restaurant, I don't want my kids to be loud because I don't want to be a bother. I don't want to draw attention. I, I wouldn't knock on your door at 2 a.m. to ask if... I would, I would go without. I, I just don't want to be a, a bother. How many of you feel like you're a bother to God? So in this story... Uh, in this story, the, the, the friend who's asleep... He finds his, 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 the, the visiting friend to be a real bother. And yet, the friend who's been awakened from his sleep, he doesn't want to look like a jerk. He wants to save face. So, be, so because of the visiting friend's persistence, he relents. He says, you're, you're such a bother. You... you I just want to go back to life. I want to go back to bed. And so he finally relents. He finally gives you what you need. I think there's another element in this story. The, the, the friend who has been asleep, who's awakened from his sleep, he wants to save face. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to look like a jerk. So he finally relents gives him the cup of sugar, or gives him the stick of butter, or gives him whatever he needs so that he can go back to bed. And Jesus' point in this story is God's not like that. That's a hang-up that some of us have. We might say, I, I, I asked God for something last month and he did it and I just... I don't want to be greedy. I don't want to... And I understand your heart in that, but, but, but God's not like that. In fact, if you look at the whole of Scripture, here's what you must be convinced of. 
God is not bothered by the fact that we ask for too much. God is bothered by the fact that we ask for too little. Like, like a parent, like a parent who might, who might be hurt because the child doesn't think that I can really come through. You ask for too little, child. I can give you w way more than that. What is it that C.S. What is it that C.S. Lewis says that we settle for for making mud mud pies when God wants to give us a, a day at the sea, something like that? You're not a bother to God. That is Jesus' point in story number one. God is a supplier. Yes, He is the He answers prayer, but He is He is not like your friend who finds you a bother. Story number two is about earthly fathers, dads, a lot of us dads in this room today. And then and, and dads, we aren't perfect. Jesus says that in the story. He says, you know, you're evil. He mean what he, he means in in reference to or in comparison to a heavenly father, earthly dads. We're we're comparatively evil. Um, some of us, by the world's standards, probably aren't considered evil um, in the strongest sense of the word. But 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 we're not perfect. But even in our imperfection, we're we're still kind. To our kids. I mean, if you're a good dad, you're, you're kind, even, like, like some of us dads, maybe, maybe, probably so. Some of, some of us thieves, cheaters, very selfish men, most of us, don't really have any desire to help anyone out. Like, that's a lot of us. But when your kids need something, then you're on it. I mean, it's different when it's your kid, right? Like it's your own flesh and blood. But have you ever hung out with somebody else's dad? Like, like a dad who's pretty selfish, pretty self-absorbed, Pretty tight, pretty chinse, and then he he takes, let's say, his kid and you when you were a kid, or his kid and your kid, to the fair. And he pays for his kid to, you know, throw the ball at the monkey or whatever. But he doesn't spend money on you, he just spends money on his kid, and then and then he goes and, and he gets his kid a, a, a raspa or gets his kid kettle corn or whatever but but you're just along for the ride because you're not his kid I mean maybe you hope not but maybe you knew maybe you had a friend who had a dad like that back in the day you know I'm here I'm here Mr. Mr. Nobody's named Jones I'm here Mr. Jones like you I hope hope uh uh like you bought him, I mean, I know he's your kid, and I'm just, I'm just the friend. But, but I'd like, I'd like, a, a, I'd like a, a, a soda. I, I'd like a hamburger. And Jesus says in this story number two, God's not like that. He doesn't, he doesn't play favorites. He doesn't, he doesn't bless the kids around you while ignoring you like you don't even belong to him. Let me ask you, how many of you wonder if God even gives a rip about you personally? Maybe you've had the thought, God's good to others, but he's not good 
to me. Maybe you've wondered that. Maybe you have quietly considered that. Like, like maybe I'm not really his child. Because he doesn't treat me well. He treats other kids well. Why would you pray to a God who doesn't care about you personally? And, and Jesus' point here is, God's not like an evil, earthly father. He's way more than that. He cares about his stepkids too, which is every one of us. And then there's a third story. A wicked judge helps a widow. She's, she's been mistreated out in, the, out in society and she comes to the courtroom. She comes to the wicked judge and she asks, won't, won't, you, won't you provide justice for me? Won't you right the wrong that has been done done to me? And the wicked judge in the third story says, I don't fear God. I don't fear man. I think what he's saying is he's admitting his own lack of justice, his own lack of ethic, his, his wanton mismanagement of his of his power and responsibility. And yet he says, he says, because of her persistence, I'm going to impart justice. But, but, but what you see here is, is uh, this judges, his judgment is, it's arbitrary. It's, it's tricky. It's elusive. It can't be trusted. And how many of us deep down don't really trust God? Ah, dear friends, I, I, I go through periods of real of real fear. And 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 you do too, most likely. Real fear. And what I mean by that, fear of God, but not not fearing him in a in an esteeming um, um, Old Testament language kind of a way, not fearing God in, in, in the sense that we revere or we esteem or we think highly of him. When you hear the word, it's, it's a kind of a King James way of saying how we, how we esteem God, but, but if you hear people saying that it's biblical to fear God, it, it's not the kind of fear that most of us that I experience with God. My fear goes like this. It, I, what I mean by it is I, I fear whether or not he's really who he says he is. Meaning you fear whether or not he is truly loving. Whether or not he's re really there for you. you. You fear whether or not he can be counted on. Maybe he's like that, that tricky judge who, whose judgment is arbit arbitrary and, and careless. And Jesus is saying, God's not like that. Like, yeah, that lady randomly at that moment in time received justice, but, but, but God's not like that. God is just all the time. In fact, that is a central theme throughout the Old and the New Testament is that God loves justice. But hear with me, hear with me, friends, what those words really, really mean. If, if, you, if you really honestly study the Bible and you look at God's love for justice, what you'll find is it, 
It doesn't mean that, 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 that God loves incarceration. That God loves punishment. What it means is that God loves to see those who are mistreated, esteemed, and affirmed, and treated justly for a change. We see it in Jesus' teachings in the, in the, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the, in the Beatitudes, in Matthew 5 and, and following, where, where he says, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed, blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are those that mourn. God, God is just all the time. And that's Jesus' point. Jesus' point is that, that, that God is, is the supplier of, of, of all of your needs. He is the answerer of your prayers. But he's not like these three figures that we often make him, make him like in, in our imagination. He's, he's a good God. He's, he's a just God all the time. <clears throat> so again, Jesus' goal is that we would not lose heart. That we would be persistent in praying. Jesus told, told these stories so we wouldn't give up. So we'd pray always. Have you ever given up? Maybe, maybe that's where you're at right now. You've given up. Jesus' message is persist. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Rescue is coming. There have been a few times in my life, not, not many, but there have been a few times in life where I had a goal, and I, something that I wanted to achieve, and I, I am now looking back, I realize I gave up just a little too soon. I'm a pretty persistent guy. I'm a pretty tenacious guy. I'll, I'll put my nose to the grindstone. I'll go at it for a long time, but there have been a few times. <clears throat> but that's not the point. The point is Jesus is saying, persist. <clears throat> Be diligent in your prayer. Just a little longer. Hang in there. Rescue is coming. Jesus says, so I tell you, keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Now, now if, if, if Jesus was saying that it would be easy and that it would come immediately and all it takes is one prayer and, and, and it just, just, if you just had enough faith you could get it now, then Jesus wouldn't be using this language. He wouldn't say persist. He wouldn't say keep on. He wouldn't say hang in there just a little longer. Rescue is around the corner. It's not here yet. Keep on praying. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. To everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Now, we take Jesus at his word. That's what it means to be a Christ follower. We take him at his word. So I ask, are you frustrated? Are you frustrated in your prayers? In some areas of my life, I am. There are things where I, I'm, I'm frustrated. I've, I've prayed for this. I've prayed for this. And I'm waiting. I mean, like some of the biggest issues... You know, like maybe uh, maybe everyone of or maybe everyone's like this. So like I got two or three like closed-handed issues. Like like God, I mean humility and respect. I really I really need for this to happen. And this isn't trivial stuff. Maybe I pray about some some secondary matters, but this is this is primary stuff. What I'm praying here, and I'm 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 I'm, I'm weary. I'm frustrated. And Jesus tells us, he tells us one reason why our prayer life can, well, 
can actually be a waste of time, really. I said, Jesus, these are the inspired words of the Lord, but this is the writing of James. The Holy Spirit wrote through him. James <clears throat> chapter 4. He says this, he says, yet, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. That speaks to prayerlessness. It's, it's, it's a, it, is a, it is a New Testament teaching. Some of us here don't have what we need because we don't ask God. That's simple. That may sound harsh. But that's what the Bible says. Some of us today don't have what we need simply because we don't ask. But then James goes on and he says, for some of us it's another issue. He says, and when you ask, you don't get what you ask for because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. So I invite you to think on that today. The nature, the essence of your prayers. Um, it's not that God doesn't want us to be pleased. He certainly does. But there are times in my, when in my life where pleasure becomes my God. And I become an, an idol worshiper. Start breaking several of the Ten Commandments, right? Because I, I worship something other than God. I worship pleasure. And James says, in God's economy, in God's uh, system, in the kingdom of God that he is setting up for those of us that are his followers, he, can, he, he would never answer a prayer that, that, that usurps him, that makes him less, less of a God and makes pleasure the ultimate God. God won't answer prayers like that. It's not good for us. It doesn't bless us. It doesn't really please us. It's like poison actually. And it, and it, it robs him of his glory. James says some of us, we don't have what we need because we don't ask. And James says, some of us, we don't get what we want because what we're asking for is like poison. The good God wouldn't give us that. So, I end, I end today with uh, just some really practical ideas on, on how to pray. Practical tips for effective seasons of prayer. Um, would prayer hacks? Would that be a, would that be a right? Would that be an, an accurate uh, phrase? I think right. I think I think I'm using that word correctly. Um, some ideas. As your pastor, uh, somebody who 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 prays much, and somebody who goes through periods in which I struggle with prayerlessness. Um, to some degree, an older man speaking to some younger men and women and people who are older than me still. Uh, here are some, some practical tips. Um, but at the end of the day, like a lecture on praying isn't going to make you a prayer. The Holy Spirit is going to make you a prayer. Um, Practical tips for effective seasons of prayer. I've got three of them. One is go on long walks and pray. Some of you have maybe tried to pray for a 10-minute stint and you find yourself uh, dozing, nodding off to sleep, doing the old head dip thing. You, uh, uh, have, uh, you find yourself um, wanting to check your phone because it just pinged or whatever, whatever that noise is that it makes. And so I'm suggesting that you, I'm talking a long walk. I'm talking like go, go on a, go on a one hour walk. Boyce, come, would you come for me? Just come for me. He didn't know ahead of time that he was going to do this. Come on up here. So, so, 
Imagine we're going on a walk and I'll be Rand, Pastor Randy and you, you be God, okay? All right? <laughs> I'm going to walk and I'll be like, I'll say, you know, God, I really, uh, I really feel like a loser today. And I know I'm not, but I need, I need to be encouraged. Now you say something back to me, but you know, say, say, say something back to me. Say like, you're not a loser, Randy. <laughs> Just, even if you don't think it, say I'm not, you're not a loser, Randy. Okay, so anyway, the point is, no one else, the point is, no one else will hear, no one else will hear God speaking to you. But I, I'm going to promise you, God will speak to you. No one else, just like you can't hear voice, right? You can sit down. No one else, no one else will hear, but you will hear, you will hear the voice of the Lord. It will be inaudible, most likely. Your neighbors, we got some, we have some, we have some weird neighbors, but they, they think I'm weird because I, I do this sometimes and they think I'm talking to myself. Um, but I'm not. I'm talking to God. And, and, and the reason I would suggest that you go on a long walk is, if you're like me, my mind at times wanders. I'm like, is that an osprey or, a, or is that a chicken hawk? I know the difference between the two, but I, I see a bird and then, and then, I, and then I'm, I come back to my prayer. And I refocus and I recenter and I don't give up and I, I keep on, I persist in my prayer. And that's the beauty of going on a long walk is that, that you can persist. It's okay if during an hour long walk you only really, really drill down deep for about 20 minutes. That's okay. Prayer hacks. Um, number two would be to pray through scripture. That may be a tall order for some of you right now if you're largely unfamiliar with the Bible, but, 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 but I, I often, I've told you this before, I often, uh, I often pray through 2 Chronicles 7. Um, I've, we talked about this uh, a few months ago, but 2 Chronicles 7, 14. We prayed, we prayed it some as a church a few months ago. It says, if my people who are if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. So I'll pray through this sometimes. I'll spend 40, 40 45 minutes just praying, God, I step, this first step, I you said, if, if my people will, who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. God, I, I humble myself before you. God, I, God I, at times I think I'm all that, but, but really I'm not. Like I'm, I'm, like a, I'm like a child in need. I, I humble myself. Jesus, I often think I'm running the show, but actually I want you to be my Lord. I humble myself. And then I go on and I'll spend time speaking words of humility before the Lord and then I'll, they humble themselves and pray. And, and, and so I take that to mean that I tell God like what I need. You don't have to go in this order exactly, but I, and then it says, and, and seek my face. And so what I take that to mean is that I, I, I want to know the Holy Spirit, see his activity in my life more in a more real way. Uh, fashion. So I, I, God, I want to see your face. I, I've, I've spoken of how I want to see your hand, but, it, you know, working in my life, but I want to see your face. It's very personal. I want to just know your presence and turn from their wicked ways. And so I'll say, God, I've really been, this is an area of sin in my life. I, I, I want to turn from that because, God, you're better. Like all the sin that we have in our lives is because we think sin is good. And to some degree and temporarily, it can be. But we turn, we turn from our sin because I say, God, you're better. Your presence is better. Communion with you is, is better. Having relation with you is better. So I turn, I, I turn from my wicked ways and I turn to you. 
And, and, and what does God say he'll do? He says he'll, he'll <clears throat> forgive my sin and he'll heal the land. He'll, he'll heal my life. He'll, he'll bring better days. So, so, so that would be just step number two, or just the second idea, rather. These really aren't steps. But the second idea would be to pray through Scripture. And the last one I have is, <clears throat> is, is um, a bit different. Like you might say, you mean pray for your friends and their children or pray for your children? And, and I pray much for my own children. But I really mean what I say here. Um, pray for your friends' children. I don't, I just, there's something, it's a, it's a season in my life now where I, 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 I just find deep joy in praying for other people's children. Maybe it's because parenting has, has gotten, my kids are, Beautiful, awesome, couldn't ask for better kids in the world. But, but parenting has gotten super complicated, like more complicated than it ever has been. And so like maybe I'm praying for, for, uh, for, for your kids, hoping you're praying for my kids. I don't know, but I've just found deep, deep um, joy in praying for other people's kids. So, so, so recently, I, so I've got a, I've got a pastor friend uh, really, really good man. His church gave the first check to River Church. Not to me, but to River Church way back in the day. I think they gave $1,000 to get River Church off the ground. And he's a good man. And his, his, his kids are a little bit younger than, than my kids. And his 17-year-old son, 17 or 18-year-old son, senior in high school, going to play college ball, signed with the, with the university at a good baseball program. Just a, just a week ago, this 17-year-old fella was playing one of his last football games, which football isn't really a sport. He just plays. Blew out his ACL, which means it ruins his, his, uh, his senior year in baseball. You know, will the, will the, the, will the university that signed me, will they, will they, will they make good on, on my uh, <clears throat> scholarship? You know, will they revoke that? Like... The, the family is, you know, it's, at that moment in time, that was a big, big deal. And so, so I'm, I'm praying for him. I'm praying for him. And I'm telling you this, because understand how this comes back on me. It really is a blessing to me. I was praying for him that day, uh, and I thought, well, what God brought to mind is, Randy, your kids, your five children have gone through crises. They have, they have gone through situations that were heavy burdens. This is God talking to me. And like burdens where, where Lydia and I would be like, man, I wish, I wish that would, would happen to me. Like disappointments, letdowns, know my kid's heartbroken. Like I, I would rather me be heartbroken if, if, if you could just, just not, God not put her, not put him in. Like I, put me in that, but not my kid. And, and what the Lord brought to my mind that day was that, that in every one of those circumstances, looking back now, it's all been for good. Like I wouldn't change those. I, I, I embrace God's goodness and all that. So, so I had the privilege of just texting my friend a few days ago and saying, here's what the Lord said to me. And I, 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 don't, know, I don't know your deal and I, I don't pretend like I totally understand what you're going through. But here, here's, here's been my situation in, in raising kids that are a little bit older than your kids. And, and here's what, I, what the Lord said to me. And, and I, I trust it was a blessing to him, but you know what? It was a blessing to me. If you're struggling with, with, with prayerlessness in your own life, uh, finding a dose, a measure of humility and servanthood in praying for others, I think will be a blessing to you. So I think it's good and right and appropriate. And uh, week one of, of this sermon series, um, I think it's good and right for us to, to end this time with prayer. I'll pray out loud and you pray silently. Let's, let's bow together.